My recruitment by the FBI was very efficient. Very simple, really. I arrived on the day Fred Hampton died. Uh, real niggas smoked the plot. I arrived on the day Fred Hampton got murdered. Hold up. Assassinated just to clarify further. Well, I always understood the movement uh, from Martin Luther King's angle. Uh, in my view, he was the movement. Um, the Panthers, uh, their perspective was as black revolutionaries, black nationalists. They really uh, didn't want this government. They wanted to overthrow this government. They wanted to embarrass this government. They wanted to punch holes in the system. They wanted to investigate and um, illustrate its shortcomings. That was their purpose. They, they were a vanguard. At one point, um, the, the party members embraced uh, um, the, uh, Huey P. Newton's writings it was a theory of revolutionary suicide. They felt like their job was to get out there and basically die uh, to set an example. Um, they were sacrificial lambs, okay, uh, for the people. That was the, their their position. It was a, a phase. They were they were not really in the mainstream civil rights movement, in my opinion. They got together here if you do the Bobby Seals. Yes, they got together with guns, and there's nothing wrong with that. Because we need some guns. Black people need some peace. White people need some peace. And we are going to have to fight. We're going to have to struggle. We're going to have to struggle relentlessly to bring about some peace. Because the people that we're acting for peace, they're a bunch of megalomaniac warmongers. And they don't even understand what peace means. And we've got to fight them. We've got to struggle with them to make them understand what peace means. Bobby Seale is going through all types of physical and mental torture. But that's all right, because we said even before this happened, and we're going to say it after this, and after I'm locked up, and after everybody's locked up, that you can jail a revolutionary, but you can't jail a revolution. Right. You might run a liberator like Harris Cleave out the country, but you can't run liberation out the country. You might murder a freedom fighter like Bobby Hutton, but you can't murder freedom fighting. And if you do, you come up with answers that don't answer explanations that don't explain. You come up with conclusions that don't conclude. And you come up with people that you thought should be acting like pigs, just acting like people and moving on pigs. And that's what we've got to do. So we're going to see about Bobby, regardless of what these people think we should do. Because school is not important and work is not important. Nothing's more important than stopping fascism because fascism will stop us all. Bill, can you describe to me the circumstances under which you began working for the FBI? Uh, uh, it was in probably 1967. Um, I was with a guy one night, a friend of mine, and uh, we were drinking beer and we decided to go joyride. And we jumped in the car and stole it. And we were driving around the city of Chicago for uh, oh, 45 minutes and decided to leave the state to go visit a relative in another state. And um, we had an accident out of state. And prior to the accident, we had walked in a pool hall and was shooting pool. And at this, uh, at the door, you had to register your phone number and address. And we wrote down our names and phone numbers, then went and shot a game of pool, and then came out and had an accident. We fled the accident on uh, on foot, um, messed around in the city a while, and then caught a bus back to Chicago. And uh, oh, about three, four months later, I got a call from uh, this FBI agent by the name of Roy Mitchell. And um, he told me that he knew what I had done. And we talked, we went around a, a couple of times, and he said something like, well, you know, and uh, there's no need in you trying to bullshit me. I know you did it, but it's no big thing. He said, I'm sure we can work it out. And um, I think a few a few months passed before I heard from him again. And um, one day I got a call, and he told me that uh, <clears throat> it was payback time. He said that uh, I want you to go and see if you can join the Black Panther Party, and if you can, give me a call. Roy said basically, um, just go and see if you can join the Black Panther Party. I understand they they're recruiting 
Panther members. So why don't you go down to the office and see if you can join. If you get in, give me a call back. So um, the next day, <clears throat> I uh, got on the bus and went down to the office of the Black Panther Party. It was located on Western and Madison. And um, walked in the office, about three or four Panthers in the office. And I think I was about the fifth member in the Chicago chapter to join. It's sort of like a primary thing with me. I'm the, I'm the first move that they'll make. I'm a part of an organization who will be the first organization they'll move on because I happen to be a part of an organization, the Black Panther Party, that is the only organization, in fact, that has came out and stood up loud and clear and said that we don't care what anybody says, whether they have guns or not, and badges or 18 uniforms, if whatever they step outside the bounds of legality <laughs> into the bounds of illegality, we'll blow their brains out if they're bothering the people. Right and what makes them mad about that? They're constantly bothering the people. Anybody that's out there for the protection of the people happens to be in direct conflict with them. What makes them mad about it? What makes them mad about it is that they have black people and white poor people and red poor people and Puerto Rican poor people and Latin American Puerto Rican people of uh, all poor people of all descents. They have them caught up in movements based on racism when the Black Panther Party stood up and said that we don't care what anybody says. We don't think you fight fire with fire best, we think you fight fire with water best. We're going to fight racism, not with racism, but we're going to fight with solidarity. We said we're not going to fight capitalism with black capitalism, but we're going to fight it with socialism. We stood up and said we're not going to fight reactionary pigs and reactionary state attorneys like this and reactionary state attorneys like Hanrahan with any other reactions on our part. We're going to fight their reaction with all of us people to get together and have an international proletarian revolution. Right on. Right on. Right on. Right on. And that's saying all power to the people. Right that's saying that no matter what color you are, you, there's only two classes. And that's saying that there's a class over here and there's a class over there. And the reason that this class over here has never did anything to get this class off its back because this is lower, this is upper, this is the oppressed, this is the oppressor, this is the exploited, this is the exploiter. And these people in this class have divided themselves. They say, I'm black and I hate white people. I'm white and I hate black people. I'm Latin American and I hate hillbillies. I'm hillbillies and I hate Indians. So we fight amongst each other. And you, you, you've heard the testimony of pigs here. You got pigs of all colors, you know that. You got pigs that are white, you got pigs that are black, you even got pigs that are black and white. Propagating the same type of madness that uh, the, this buffoon Henry had would be propagating if he were here himself. And why? Because they want to keep you to believing that I'm your enemy and that everybody else that's black and that wears a lot of hair on his head and hair on his face. They want to keep you thinking that he's your enemy. I thought Fred Hampton was pretty um, idealistic. He was pretty dedicated to the black struggle. I felt like he gave a lot. He gave his life. And uh, out of the 16 months that I knew him, I don't have anything bad to say about him. I, I'm sorry that uh, he died like he did. Uh, he was... Uh, in my opinion, he was murdered by the Chicago Police Department. I felt like uh, he was a person that died for what he believed in. Um, had he lived today, he probably uh, would be a politician, a successful politician. I grew up in a middle class neighborhood and I had very little idea of, of, of I was apolitical. Um, the Panthers I had heard of only from a recent article, I think, that had occurred in the paper, Huey P. Newton had just been in a shootout with the, with the Oakland Police Department, and one of them had died. And um, there was a lot of press about that. But uh, prior to the articles I had read about Huey P. Newton, I knew nothing of the Black Panther Party. In fact, the day I joined, I was pretty sure it was just another gang, unlike, uh, not unlike the, the Blackstone Rangers or other Cobras or something. Um, I had no idea of uh, anything about their politics. Almost immediately after uh, <clears throat> I joined the Panthers, uh, probably within 10 days, I began to realize that the Black Panther Party was a little bit more sophisticated than a gang. They drew parallels to what was going on in the past revolutions in the various countries, uh, like for instance China or Russia, and it was drawing parallels to what was going on in the current political scene within the United States. So they were drawing associations between the revolutions in, uh, in, in the communist countries, as I understood it, as to what was happening in the United States. And um, 
And so I understood them to be a little bit more sophisticated than a gang. Um, I expected that it would be weapons and we would be out there uh, doing turf battles with uh, the local gang members, but they, they weren't about that at all. They were uh, into the political scene, uh, the, the war in Vietnam, um, uh, Richard Nixon, and uh, specifically freeing Huey. As far as the, the proceedings uh, thus far that uh, uh, the courts uh, have only reflected the racist uh, attitude of the general power structure that I haven't received a fair trial, that I should not have been indicted in the first place. I was indicted by a blue ribbon grand jury, uh, a middle class white grand jury that w did not represent a cross section of the community. You say you don't feel you've had a fair trial? No. Why? Uh, number one, that the, the uh, the judge have, uh, has been very racist throughout uh, the proceeding, very pro-prosecution, that uh, I don't feel that I should have been tried at all. And uh, if I had been tried, if there was an inkling of, uh, of reason to try me, I should not have been tried for first-degree murder. Uh, that if the judge had not been a racist, that he would have uh, he would have amended the charges uh, to uh, uh, to a manslaughter, uh, perhaps. Uh, the very fact that he didn't dismiss the whole charge uh, reflects his racism. Huey P. Newton was locked down. The Black Panther Party was Huey P. Newton, and Huey P. Newton was the Black Panther Party. And uh, no matter how powerful or strong our membership got in the, in the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party, uh, no matter how many speaking engagements Hampton had, or how many donations we had, or how many papers, um, there was always a national office uh, out there to remind us that we were subservient to the national office, that we were just a chapter and we weren't the Illinois Black Panther Party, we were the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party, and their goals at that point was to free their leader, who was locked down in Alameda County Jail, uh, facing the death penalty for killing a, a police officer. Um, the party recognized that uh, at that point that they needed liaisons, they needed uh, alliances with various groups in order to survive, basically in the climate in Chicago. So they embraced the various political issues um, that was uh, of the day. Um, they got involved in all types of causes, mainly to fortify their position and to free their leader, Huey P. Newton. And he was effectively running the Black Panther Party from inside of the jails. Most of uh, our political direction um, was mandated, uh, came out through his lawyers, and was passed on nationally through the chapters. The Panthers weren't too active militarily, okay, they were politically organizing at that point. Uh, they were recruiting at that point. Um, the Panthers were trying to, um, well, they, they had speaking engagements at the, at the different colleges and so forth, so we were, we were in an organizing process. And uh, there was very little criminal activity, as I could determine what was going on, very little to report to the FBI, in my mind, you know, because I felt like since the FBI was a, a, a an investigative body investigating federal crimes that um, crimes were what they were looking at and so tell me a little bit about how you felt about working for the FBI what motivated you and um, what you thought you were what ends you thought you were serving well in my community the policemen were I mean it was a quickest way to gain respect I mean I think uh, I grew up wanting to be a policeman admiring and respecting policemen although I always thought it was outside of my reach um, I, my neighborhood was not unlike most people that grow up in Chicago, most young people. We were very mischievous and did a lot of uh, juvenile type, uh, petty criminal type things, but um, stealing a car and all of a sudden having the FBI, having a case with the FBI, the thought of being, having really going to jail uh, got my attention. And uh, so when he asked me to join the Black Panther Party, and he used terms, he never used the word informant. He always said, you're working for me, and I associated him as the FBI. So all of a sudden, I was working for the FBI. I felt like I was working undercover for the FBI, doing something good for the finest police organization in America. And so I was pretty proud. The um, activities uh, within the party was high speed. Um, we were in our bloom. Uh, we had about 500 members. We were selling probably about 
25,000 newspapers in the city of Chicago every week, or the Panther newspaper, that is. Um, we had um, various um, members of uh, our party, of the Black Panther Party, going to the colleges all over the state, speaking engagements. Donations were coming in to the tune of about $1,500, $2,000 a day. But at the same time, the Chicago police had stepped up their activities also. A lot of our a lot of the members were being arrested on petty charges. So the money we were bringing in on the one hand and donations, money that came through the mail anonymously, blank checks and money orders, was going right out in bail money. So um, it, was, it was intense. And uh, in that regard, the Black Panther Party was everywhere and doing everything. We had 500 members and everybody was aggressive. And uh, it was hard for me to report on all of the activities that were occurring. I could only concentrate on what uh, my little group was doing. Fred Hampton was in charge mainly with speaking engagements, uh, public relations, uh, um, reaching the people, recruiting, um, and things of that nature. He was the chief spokesman. Um, he was the one that the cameras saw all the time. But Bobby Rush and our group was the operations. We were activities at that point. It was our job to defend the officers uh, against the police, uh, uh, to get members out of jail, to discipline the members, uh, to kind of, you know, maintain the police control of the organization, to deal with informants and so forth. At some point, a meeting was um, arranged. Uh, we met with Jeff Fort uh, of the Blackstone Rangers, and at that meeting, we were in a Catholic church. I remember that night uh, we were setting up, and Jeff Fort told Fred Hampton, there, there is not going to be any Black Panthers in the city of Chicago. You guys either join the Blackstone Rangers or get out of the city. And um, Hampton came away from that meeting uh, feeling like we were going to eventually have to do battle with these guys. There was no compromise. They, didn't, they couldn't associate, they, the Blackstone Rangers, couldn't associate our purpose politically with uh, their gang turf thing. So uh, we were going to have to deal with them. So the word went out to me to basically start uh, buying weapons. We also knew that uh, the state's attorney had declared war on us, and pretty soon uh, we were going to face a, a raid at one of our offices. And the mentality at that time was that we know it's coming. Um, our job is to set an example for the people. We, we, we must be ready. After a while, he and I became friends, and we talked in casual conversation about what I was doing in the Black Panther Party. Well, the whole nature of that relationship changed right around November, maybe November 13, when two police officers were killed by a Black Panther member named Jake Winters on the south side of Chicago. Um, that night, um, as I understand the, the, the gun battle, uh, Jake Winters straddled one of the officers who were wounded in the shootout and um, performed a coup de grace a mercy killing. He straddled the officer after the officer was, after the officer was down and, and put a shotgun to his head and put him out of his misery. It, or at least that's the way the newspaper described it. And I think the whole city, I think the Black Panthers took the rap for that one when they really didn't deserve it. Because um, Jake Winters was out there on his own. He wasn't out there on any official m member uh, a mission for the Black Panther Party. He was out there on his own, and uh, he got into a altercation with a guy, and the guy called the police, and the police came, and the shootout broke out, and uh, two police officers were killed, and Jake Winters were killed. Well, the Panthers took the heat because Jake Winters was a Black Panther. And uh, past that point, uh, I noticed uh, maybe a couple of days after this officer was killed, uh, Mich Mitchell had this uh, this grim, solemn atmosphere about itself and I could tell he was looking for specific he wanted specific criminal violations he wanted something that he could move on and I think he may have implied or even expressed that at one or two points he's he expressed his anger over what had happened how the, I mean the total disregard for life and I mean he that was the first time I ever saw him express his a personal opinion about uh, what he thought the Black Panthers were doing. The uh, most vulnerable spot was um, 
was Hampton's house because it was the one that had all the weapons in it. It was the one with the uh, with the with the weapons. Um, very few of the other apartments had the kind of weapons he had at that apartment. So uh, when he asked me for the diagram, it didn't surprise me. I knew the raid was going to be planned. I felt like at uh, at that point, that what they wanted to do was catch him with weapons and seal his conviction. Uh, if he'd have been caught with the weapons out on appeal, he would have went straight to jail. And it, I don't, I can't recall it being expressed. I can't recall any specific conversations I've had with Mitchell about the raid, but. We had such a unity of mind, so to speak. Our efforts were basically one. Um, I understood what was going on. He didn't have to tell me. Um, he um, described to me going to the funeral of two police officers that got killed, and uh, I knew he was. I knew he was hurt by that, uh, and I knew he was going to do what he could to uh, help the police department. Uh, do something about it. December 3rd. It was cold that day. Uh, it was really a slow day. Uh, we were at the office. Uh, Hampton was there. Rush was there. The general staff was there. It wasn't too much activity going on streetwise because the weather was so cold. Um, it's a melancholy kind of day. It just came and went. Got down to the evening. Uh, uh, we all decided to walked the block from uh, the office to Hampton's house and eat dinner. Um, the women were cooking dinner, a big dinner, a big, I think we had chili and big pot of spaghetti and uh, most of us that had labeled at the office were looking forward to just going over there and uh, eating dinner and reading and just being together. It was uh, just a slow day. It was the last day we it would be, you know, it was the last type of day where we'd think that anything was going to happen. It was just too quiet. Nothing was happening. The brother was shot four or five times, so after they came through the door, they shot him again to make sure he was dead. Mr. Montgomery, uh, Dr. Constantino testified today that Mark Clark could not have struggled after receiving that shot through the heart. Now, in your mind, does this contradict the testimony of Officer Davis, who described a struggle? Uh, yes. It seems to me that that was a very startling thing. We also learned that uh, the bullet which was in fact recovered from Mr. Hampton's body uh, was a bullet fired uh, out of a carbine by Officer Davis. So that indicates also that Officer Davis uh, may well have walked into that back bedroom contrary to his testimony and fired a shot into the body of Fred Hampton at one point in time or other. I stepped over and I put the machine gun still on single fire and I started from the left side of the wall coming across watching where the rounds were hitting and I went over the girl's head down on the other side of her and continued fire across this wall. One strange thing about this wall is this State attorneys stop a rating pig saying that they fired uh, numerous uh, slugs going up and down, up and down with motion, attempting to avoid hitting the people in the, in the apartment here. You notice that all these slugs are on a straight line. You also notice that all were fired at a low level, at about bad level. Someone, I think it was one of the pigs, told us to come out of the room. 
because there were still shots being fired. Now, I didn't know at this here time that people had came, were coming through the back door, but I took it that shots were being fired in the back of the house and at the front of the house. And, uh, you know, they, they were all coming through, through the walls. The walls were nothing but plastic boards. And, you know, a bullet come through the front of the house and would go all the way through the, out the back. Somebody told us to get out, but I remember we were so afraid and bullets were still coming that we remained on the floor. I heard another pause, and then one of the pigs told us that if we don't come out, he was going to put something in there that would really get him out. The idea came in my mind that they were going to shoot tear gas or something in there. We realized that there are still some people remaining in the front bedroom. We don't know whether they're in here or not, so I plead and I can't, I beg them to come out. Please come out with your hands out, throw out your weapon. But the next thing I heard was a barrage of shots, real fast. And, uh, you know, we were hit this time. I started with the gun, still on single fire, being very careful and watching where each round hit on the wall. I walked them around uh, the girl sitting on the bed and brought it all the way across the wall again. As I was doing this, Officer Davis was stepping up, and he started firing across the wall from right to left. I put one shot in the door. I put a short burst with the machine gun on automatic fire into that closet. I fired four or five shotgun blasts into the bedroom. The second form, still coming up, caught a blast as the gun came further across the room. They told me, uh, you know, to get up and walk. And I told them I couldn't. And then they, I think they hit me or did something. They told me they would kill me if I stayed there. So I kept trying. I managed, you know, to get up and, uh, I made a little hop, and I found it, I hopped out, you know. Included in the exclusive was a photo carefully circled to show bullet holes supposed to be in the back door. The account that we made public yesterday gives a detailed explanation of what happened in that apartment. Uh, I stand wholeheartedly behind it as absolutely accurate. There is one inconsistency in, well, for example... Uh, I do not intend to quibble about that account. Do you know where the truth? The account that we gave of the events is the truth. One of the four pictures you gave the Tribune had two bullet holes on the right side of what was supposed to be the rear door. Uh, Henry has been, Henry, Henry had his lied before and he's going to lie again. That, that hole that he's blown up in the papers is a, is a hole of a nail. I close up of a nail head. Plus a little bit of the dark hat. Plus the door has. Mm -hmm. Now you, here you see the large nail heads being pointed out. I have said that uh, we released the pictures. We have not characterized or described uh, the uh, conditions that they portray, other than to say that that is an accurate portrayal of that uh, particular object. Only by the grace of God uh, was one of our, or two of our police officers, prevented from being killed uh, when they were fired upon as soon as they announced their office and knocking on the door. On December 11, 1969, the Chicago Tribune carried a story that it characterized as an exclusive version from the state's attorney's office. Why was the uh, disclosure made in the Chicago Tribune? Because the, that newspaper, the Chicago Tribune, in my opinion, gave a very balanced fair report of the events that occurred. It has nothing to do with the class of people or the type of people that buy the Tribune as opposed to other papers in the city? Does anybody have a sensible question? I urge your inventory of each of these vicious weapons, this attack, this attack by the Black Panthers on the police, plus the rep weapons which were recovered uh, at the uh, depot where they were storing them, clearly demonstrates the true character of the Black Panther Party. Nobody, I've never denied that there was no weapons there. As a matter of fact, he would be a fool if he didn't have a weapon there, knowing uh, the, the ferociousness of the pigs, how they just jump out of the cars and, and shoot you down, how they knock on your door and blow 19-year-old uh, sister's head off with shotguns, how they kill two brothers in, in one week. Uh, yeah, he's, and as a matter of fact, everybody that, that, that's concerned should have a, a something in their home to protect themselves because Hanrahan is a madman. Someone came into the room, started shaking the chair. 
the chairman, chairman, wake up the pigs was laughing. And I saw bullets coming from it looked like the front of the apartment, from the kitchen area. They were pigs to shoot. And uh, about this time, I jumped on uh, top of the chair. He looked up. Looked like all the pigs burst at the entranceway to the bedroom area, back bedroom area. The mattress is just going. You can feel the bullets going into it. I just knew he was dead, everybody in there. Um, when he looked up, looked up, he didn't say a word, he didn't move, except for moving his head up. He laid his head back down to the side like that. He never said a word, he never got up off the bed. A uh, person was in the room, they kept calling out, stop shooting, stop shooting. We have a pregnant woman or pregnant sister in here. At the time, I was eight and a half to nine months pregnant. My baby was delivered in two weeks. Pigs kept on shooting. So I uh, kept on hollering out. Finally, they stopped. They pushed uh, me and the other brother by the uh, kitchen door and told us to face the wall. Heard a pig say, he's barely alive, he'll barely make it. I assume they were talking about Chairman Fred. So then, they started shooting the pig, they started shooting, up, shooting again. I heard the sister scream. They stopped shooting. The pig said, he's good and dead now. The pigs were running around laughing, they were really happy, you know. Talking about Chairman Fred dead. Again. I am taking the word of our policeman uh, over what we understand is supposed to be a version provided by a defense attorney and by the occupants of the apartment. I was hit five times. I was hit uh, two times in the stomach, one time in the leg, and I was hit the graze in each hand. Yeah. This is just a scar, you know, I had to have a section of my colon taken out because of an infection. And I was shot over here. I expect the general public to recognize the quality of these men's work and the political consequences can take care of themselves. Of course I don't plan to resign. Well, the following day, uh, I went directly to the office, and uh, the office was empty, unusually empty. It was one girl sitting behind a desk, and she was on the phone, and there was just no people there. And I walked in, I guess it was about oh, 10 o'clock in the morning, and I walked in, and um, I was waiting on her to get off the phone to ask, you know, what was up. And I saw a Sun Times, a copy of Sun Times laying there and had his picture on there and had uh, Panther Leader Slain on it. And uh, boy, I felt bad. I felt just, oh. I mean, and I remember uh, walking out of the office and, uh, and looking through a little clearing over on the, ne the next block, which was right in front of uh, the Monroe Street address and seeing a lot of <clears throat> police cars over there. And um, at that time, Bobby Rush came to the office. Uh, he had just come from over there, or maybe the coroner's office. In any case, we walked back over there, and uh, we both were speechless. We just walked through the house and and saw where what had taken place and where he died, and it was it was shocking. Um, that was what, well. You know, that was, um, I think I think it was that morning that I began to feel, that I felt really, I mean, everything that I had done flashed before me. I began to, I began to put, put it all together, pretty much. And um, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it was just shocking. Went to the office that morning, and you saw the headline, and then it hit you. 
Well, it, it didn't really hit me then. It, it hit me after I walked into that house. Um, it was cold and it, it was blood everywhere and it was holes in the wall and and then I was, you know, I just began to realize that the information that I supplied leading up to that moment had facilitated that raid. I knew that indirectly uh, I had contributed and I felt it and I felt bad about it. The slaying of Fred Hampton was definitely a loss to uh, to black people uh, in general. Uh, he would have made a fine, he was a fine leader then and he would have made a better leader. He was only maturing then. I mean, he was 22 years old. And uh, we tried to develop negative information to discredit him just like we did uh, everybody else. We, meaning the FBI, I tried to come up with uh, signs of him doing drugs or, or something and uh, never could. He was clean. He was dedicated. I've had private conversations with him. Uh, we got along pretty well. Uh, for about seven months, I was his personal bodyguard. He wouldn't go anywhere without me. And I know Fred Hampton better than anybody, to tell you the truth. Um, he was dedicated. That's, that's all I can say to it. Yeah, I was shocked. I felt a little... I didn't feel like I had done anything. I didn't walk in there with guns. I didn't shoot him. FBI didn't do it. I felt uh, somewhat like I was betrayed. I felt like if anyone should have known it was going to be a raid that morning, I should have known also. I felt like I could have been caught in that raid. I was there that night, and I felt like uh, if I had laid down, I probably would have been a victim. So I felt betrayed. I felt like I felt like I was expendable. I felt like um, like perhaps uh, I was on the wrong side. Yeah, yeah, I had my misgivings. I'm not gonna, I no, I, I'm not gonna sit here now and take the responsibility for the raid. You know, uh, I'm not gonna do that. I didn't pull the trigger. I didn't issue the warrant. I didn't put the guns in the apartment. So I'm not going to take responsibility for that, but I do feel like uh, I was betrayed. I felt like I should have known the raid was coming down. I felt like it was probably um, excessive. I just began to understand basically how serious and deadly the game we had all been playing for 16 months. The reality of what we were doing just came to bear on us that morning. I think. I think the membership was, was automatically decreased by 300 members that, that never showed up again when that happened. I think that uh, all, of the, uh, all of our enemies, all of the Black Panther Party's enemies came out of the woodwork to capitalize on the situation. Bobby Rush. Uh, was angry for quite a few days about all of the national leaders that showed up to lend support to the Black Panthers who wouldn't sit down and have a conference with them early in the game. All of those people that showed up at Freddie Hampton's funeral and looked over his coffin um, didn't give him 10 minutes of their time when he was alive. I have known quite a few FBI agents and uh, I've worked with them for the last five or six years and they've never asked me to compromise my morals and my principles. Contrary to public belief, I haven't been instructed to commit crimes or provoke crimes or conduct burglaries or inject drugs in people uh, or to commit murder. I haven't been. Um, if anything, uh, my association with the FBI made me a better person. How did they treat you when you, when you were relaxing with Mitchell? Did there ever any other agents there? Did you not only was I treated, I had been to Mitchell's home. I have held his child in my hands, uh, in my arms when he was one years old. I have been through the offices of the FBI uh, wearing sneakers and, and a dirty t-shirt with Mitchell. I rode around with him in his car during that time, uh, three or four months after I became a Panther. Uh, I've eaten at his table, at his dinner table. Um, we had a very at one point, uh, he was a role model for me. 
when I needed one. I mean, we had very few role models back then. We had Malcolm X, uh, we had Martin Luther King, uh, we had Muhammad Ali, and I had an FBI agent. Were you aware specifically, through Mitchell, of a program called COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program? At the time, no. I had no idea of any national uh, program out to get the Panthers. I had uh, no idea. In retrospect, uh, I can determine, I have determined from the type of information that I probably contributed greatly to it, and I felt bad about it. And then I got mad. You know, I had, uh, and then I had to conceal those feelings, which made it worse. I couldn't, I couldn't say anything. I just had to continue to play the role. And um, I think it was at that point that I lost, uh, I lost something. I lost something, uh, I mean, everything that I thought we were doing to fight crime had a different message after that. You know, it was a, it was a blow. It's the best I can do with that one.